Good afternoon. My name is Amara Zubike, and I'm the Director of Behavioral Health Policy and Advocacy in the Office of Government Relations here at Boston Children's Hospital. And I will be acting as your moderator for today's roundtable discussion. On behalf of the Office of Government Relations, it is my privilege to welcome you today to today's webinar on workforce challenges and successes in the age of COVID-19. We have convened this conversation in the midst of an ongoing pandemic and escalating children's behavioral health crisis nationwide and a heightened spotlight on systemic racism. All the while, the healthcare workforce has stepped up in numerous ways. The goal of this session is to acknowledge that and to shine a light on the importance of supporting a robust, culturally and racially diverse workforce, given everything that we are collectively navigating. Before we begin and I introduce you to our esteemed panelists, I have a few housekeeping notes. For today's discussion, we receive various questions with registration and we'll address these questions with the panel. That said, if you should have any additional questions during today's conversation, please type your questions into the Q&A box at any time and we will try our best to get to those as well. Also, after today's session, you will receive an email that includes a link to the recording of this webinar. So we have a great session today and I'm excited to, I'm very excited to introduce you to our all-star panel. Dr. Ivy Ziacco is the Associate Chief for Clinical Services in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the Medical Director of the Psychiatry Quality Program. Prior to moving into her current role, she served as a Medical Director for the Psychiatry Consultation Service for 11 years. Allison Scobie Carroll is the Senior Director of Social Work and Family Services. In her role, she provides senior leadership and clinical oversight in the Department of Psych Social Work, along with interpreter services, the child protection team, the Health Center for Families and the Patient Family Housing Program. Prior to moving into her current role in 2012, Allison served as the Program Director of the Child Protection Program at Boston Children's for nearly a decade. And Ellen Rothstein is the Vice President for Human Resources in the Department of Human Resources. Prior to moving into her current role in 2019, Ellen served as an Associate General Counsel in the Hospital General Counsel's Office for over 13 years. And with that, I'd like to open today's roundtable with a question for the entire group. In light of everything that our nation, state, and hospital has navigated in the last year and a half, can each of you describe the most pressing workforce challenge that your department has faced and any key initiatives that your department has taken to address the challenge? And how about we kick things off with Dr. Ibiziako? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, you know, nationally, we've been experiencing with the healthcare providers in particular about a 20% loss um, in our workforce. And there's been a lot of attention um, around mental health and the mental health crisis since the onset of the pandemic. But it's important to recognize that the crisis started prior to the pandemic. And so many of our providers have been facing really challenging um, working situations for a really long time. And so it's, it's definitely all come to a head in the context of now 20 months of a pandemic that has really exacerbated um, mental health demands in children and adolescents. And in our department of uh, psychiatry and behavioral sciences, we have multiple disciplines, psychiatry, psychology, psychiatric social workers, psychiatric nursing staff. And all disciplines have been impacted by uh, the workforce challenges. And so some of the things we've been doing, one important thing um, is coming together as leaders to, to start to talk about how to address the issue across all the disciplines. For example, this morning, I was in a meeting with our chief of psychiatry and chief of psychology around um, our psychiatry and, and psychology staffing. Allison and I have been in multiple meetings for months talking about psychiatric social work staff and celebrating our successes even just an hour ago. And uh, lots of uh, discussions with psychiatric, um, with our nursing leadership as well around psychiatric nursing staff. Um, and some of the initiatives that we've implemented include things like looking at compensation and making sure we make adjustments to ensure that we're competitive within the market across all disciplines. We've implemented things like bonuses and hazard pay for people who are doing double duty, taking on extra shifts during the context of this pandemic. We're looking at job designs and creating infrastructure for frontline staff, um, especially so that they're not um, 
too burdened by ad administrative tasks. Um, and then, of course, we know that our institution has been expanding mental health services. And one of the important things we, we have been doing is trying to engage our staff um, in the strategic planning efforts and giving them some insight about our long-term and short-term goals so that they have an appreciation of the fact that we're not just dealing with this crisis in the short term, but that we have long-term plans to address them. Thank you, Dr. Ivy Ziako. I think I, we could kick it to you, Allison. Sure, thank you so much. Um, I don't wanna duplicate anything that you said, so I'm gonna talk about another aspect of the challenges that we've been facing. So certainly in the context of the pandemic, one of the things that we've seen is that people have had to take on roles that are really different from the ones they were initially hired for. So people in interpreter services were instrumental in being there to you know, clean masks and welcome people, for example. Um, the Center for Families completely changed the way that it, it runs um, in terms of its physical environment. Um, additionally, you know, how we did patient family housing had to very quickly pivot. Our interpreter services, in addition, had to switch to doing telehealth and having a call center so that they could respond to the needs of Spanish-speaking families in particular who were um, disproportionately negatively impacted by the shift to telehealth. Um, so we saw the stress and strain of having to really change your role over an extended period of time. The same was true for volunteers. We have the workforce challenges associated with changes in the marketplace. But additionally, all of the areas that I oversee, <clears throat> including those in the context of the behavioral health crisis, are they are serving families who have been disproportionately negatively impacted by this crisis. So social workers, interpreter services, family housing, the Center for Families, they serve the very, the primary group that they're serving are those who were more likely to be negatively impacted in terms of job loss, housing loss. Um, the mental health crisis um, is, is a universally expected one, but when you have other societal and social pressures that are um, undermining the sort of well-being of a family, you're going to see those, those those populations more likely to find their way into our emergency room in crisis. And so our staff have been responding, living within the pandemic themselves, living with their own stress, but additionally serving populations that already we're really navigating disadvantages of every kind, all the social determinants of health, and unable to solve for them what was going on. We couldn't fix the pandemic. We couldn't make restaurants open up again. Um, and, um, and really, that means that the, the focus was in terms of social acuity was very, very high. And these are social problems that are very resistant to individual intervention. So that creates a real sense of um, powerlessness, helplessness by proxy as you try to intervene on those kinds of social problems. And that is very, very wearing. Um, typically, we have a balance of successes. We are enjoy the social connection that we have as we're interacting with patient families. And we weren't able to do that because masking, social distancing, telehealth, et cetera. So a lot of the things that typically came in to gratify and offset that hardship and acuity were also inaccessible. So the recipe is a tremendous, what that means is a lot of fatigue for folks and a sense of, of powerlessness, which really can contribute to feelings of burnout. Mm -hmm. And so thank you. We'll, we'll kick it over to you, Ellen, who's in human resources and must have been feeling this across the board at the hospital. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so it, it's interesting, you know, uh, human, we think of human resources and uh, all of the different ways that the work that the department touches the entire hospital. And, and you know, when I hear about staffing and I hear about, we talk about burnout, but, you know, all of the different areas. So obviously we, we, we help to recruit people. We help to retain them. We help to pay them. Uh, we take care of their benefits. We provide benefits and, uh, and, and then in particular occupational health services, which is also part of human resources, which has really been the front line for our, our staff to keep people safe um, throughout the pandemic. So I, I actually want to talk just a little bit about how we've been 
trying to support the whole organization and all the whole workforce because as we know, the, 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 one of the most primary features of the pandemic and the way that it's impacted people is that it's impacted absolutely every aspect of life. You know, we've all had different crises in our lives, but I don't, I can speak for myself. I can't, I cannot recall in my lifetime any crisis that has impacted everybody's life in every possible way from how you care from people, how people go to school, how we take care of our own health care, how we get to work, where we work, what time of the day we work, I, I, everything has, is, is touched every single day. It, you, you, try to, you try to turn your pandemic brain off for 24 hours, it's really hard. And I think that one of the things that we've really tried to be extremely conscious of is the whole employee. And when you come to work, when you're working, you, everything that's going on in your life with the pandemic is coming in with you and you're dealing with not just whether it's COVID within the workplace because you're a frontline healthcare worker, but if you're working remotely uh, and you don't have a place for your kids, you, or if you have to come to the hospital and your transportation has changed, your childcare issues have changed, elder care issues. So throughout the whole pandemic, we've really, within the department, worked really hard to have a multi-pronged approach to supporting employees. And that has involved um, uh, compensation programs and in particular leave programs that took care of people um, throughout the, um, the first half of the pandemic and then continuing uh, onwards. I think one of the things that we've been, uh, we've looked, we've at, we've augmented a number of childcare services. Uh, and as we are now, you know, we've added obviously uh, really a, a hybrid remote work program and, and we've learned a lot from the pandemic about how we can be much more flexible about where we work and, and, and uh, you know, across the whole organization in many, many different roles. So I think we, we try to address all of that. Um, it's ongoing. Uh, and I, you know, one of the things that, you know, I want to talk a little bit about you know, response to, to, to burnout. But I, I do think that that is something that's really foremost on our minds right now is how, how do we address where people are at today? Uh, with the workforce is, is in many, many areas really, really exhausted. And I, I want to just own that. And I, I and that's at all levels of the organization, our, our managers, our employees, everyone is very, very tired and they need a rest. Uh, and so how do we take care of each other and how do we within HR look to ways to, to try to help people and and one of the things that we just added in our benefits program uh, is uh, six free mental health visits so we're waiving copays so that's new to ensure that people are taking care of themselves really a renewed emphasis on flexible work and on you know our hybrid work remote work model uh, and just just ensuring that people take time off um, we have, you know, generous earn time program. We're adding an additional day next year. And I just really want to add, you know, people need to, to really take care of themselves. So uh, oh, thank you so much, Ellen, for that. This next question is for you, Allison, and you sort of alluded to this in your first response, but the impact that the social work department has oftentimes goes beyond physical and mental health, but also touches the overall social well-being of our patients, reaching into their homes, their schools, and communities. When thinking about community health and the social determinants of health, why is it so important to have a racially and culturally diverse workforce? Well, thank you. That's such a great question. Uh, of course, we are in a process of change and um, increasing awareness as a, as a society and as an institution of the importance of diversifying our workforce for so many reasons. And the first most fundamental reason is that it's about having the best of all of us here in this organization and having representation of our entire, of, of all the cultures and languages that make up our community and the essence of that is reflected in a diverse workforce. When people come into a healthcare environment and they have been harmed historically by systemic oppression, and that includes, unfortunately, the history of the healthcare profession, 
they come in with a history of having felt othered and not included and their access to care has not been equitably afforded them. So when we have a diverse workforce, culturally, racially, linguistically, in terms of identities, um, all the different forms and way, in ways in which difference can be reflected, people who come in for their care have a sense of being understood, a sense of belonging, a sense of safety, um, but also they will see in the institution that we truly believe that um, social justice is important and that we're willing to challenge sort of the status quo and um, diversifying our staff is a reflection of, of that. So it's at the individual level where that's recognized, um, but systemically it's incredibly important. We're enriched by diversifying our staff in all those ways. Um, and I know that we're committed to continuing to do that. We're making progress and we're gonna continue to push that forward. So those, those are just some of the reasons. That is so important. And because of that, I just wanna open it up to you, Dr. Ivy Ziako and Ellen. What are some key measures and initiatives that your department has engaged in to create an environment of equity, diversity, and inclusion? Sure, well, one of the most important things is in, just in the provision of clinical care. And we are regularly and proactively taking into consideration the impact of race, ethnicity, gender, and other cultural conditions on clinical presentations, particularly making sure we correctly have uh, diagnostic formulations, uh, understand issues around access to care, and also understand the impact of healthcare providers' behaviors <clears throat> towards our patients. Um, other initiatives are we, hospital-wide, have all engaged in the, you know, upstander to bystander um, workshops, but we are um, initiating year-round training and education around this issue in, within our department. We've also um, developed a new psychiatry health equity and diversity inclusion committee that is going to be looking at these issues around all of our missions, clinical, research, training, advocacy, policy, community work to ensure that we're doing things appropriately when it comes to health equity. So, uh the, the importance, I wanna just echo everything both of you have said, you know, the importance of, of diversity and all kinds of diversity in the workforce is, is, so, is so critically important. And uh, uh, within HR, uh, we've been working in a number of different ways to help try to increase um, the diversity of the workforce. So one of the things that we did last year is all, all of our uh, recruitment staff went through a specialized training to uh, uh, improve diverse hiring and, and, and techniques um, that we can use at, at, from a recruitment standpoint to help uh, uh, increase diversity. Uh, we, uh, with, uh, within the, we, we've tried to, we've, uh, uh, get very more involved in the employee resource group and uh, helped uh, to stand up uh, the Black, African-American and Allies employee resource group. And, and I think really being more active and visible in that space is important to around embracing people. Uh, with respect to hiring, uh, we did have 39% uh, of the hospital's hires uh, in last fiscal year were diverse. And I, I think that that is definitely uh, a very positive, uh, in good direction. Uh, we wanna continue, continue that. Uh, uh, so, uh, and then beyond that, just, uh, you know, a, a lot of training programs, uh, uh, our workforce development team has been partnering out in the community through the anchor institution, through community college programs. Um, I, it's really critical to continue to build pipelines. Uh, that, is, that is one of the most successful ways that we can uh, increase diversity. And then lastly, uh, I, I could go on for a while on this, but I do want to just note that one of the, uh, I think one of the things that's very important is we hired a chief diversity officer, um, uh, Rich Robles, uh, who just joined us uh, last month, and we're really excited to have him so that well, to continue uh, what we're doing to promote um, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, for our workforce. Thank you all. Um, 
Dr. Ibiziako, pediatric behavioral health in particular is appropriately getting a lot of national attention right now. And as a leader in the pediatric behavioral health workforce, what would you say can be done from a systems or policy perspective that can support the behavioral health workforce and also increase access to care for children? Wow. Uh, <laughs> I will just focus on a couple of things because like Ellen said, I can go on all day around this topic, but you know, I often say how care is paid for impacts how care is delivered. And reimbursement mm -hmm. continues to be a major issue when it comes to mental health care. Um, hospitals are doing what they can to try to expand services. But if they're not adequately reimbursed for mental health care, then they lose money. And then they're not incentivized to continue to provide good quality care. It impacts salaries, it impacts the workforce as a whole. So mental health reimbursement um, is a major issue. The other is still under the umbrella of, of reimbursement, but recognizing that when you're providing care, mental health care to a child or adolescent, there is more than just the face-to-face -face care that goes on um, with provision of good effective care. You need to do a lot of care coordination and collaboration and a lot of that work is not reimbursed. Um, and we also need um, from a policy perspective to address that and address some of the inequities and disparities with mental health care, such as um, prior authorizations being um, required for urgent mm -hmm. psychiatric admissions, but not for urgent medical admissions. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the list goes on, but these are just some examples. Systemically, I will go, go back to the issue of training. Um, right now, what's happening as we're all trying to expand the mental health workforce, I'll speak within Massachusetts, is that it just feels like we're circulating the same clinicians. You know, we're all borrowing from our institutions to try and staff our programs. And we need a longer term training and education plan for our workforce. We need to expand training programs across all disciplines. And even for those who do not go into mental health and consider themselves mental health providers, we still need to expand the mental health curriculum in medical schools and nursing schools and separate this whole mind-body dichotomy and have people understand if you're taking care of a patient, you're taking care of every aspect of them, including their emotions and their behaviors. Because what's happening now is that we have many healthcare providers who have these patients and don't have the training or expertise to know how to manage them. We also wanna expand um, the ability of other providers such as primary care providers and pediatricians um, with regards to their ability to provide mild to moderate um, services for, for patients with uh, mental health needs. So those are just some of the examples. Wow, there's no shortage of things that could need to take place to really address this massive problem. And that was evident in your comprehensive response, Dr. Ibiziako. Um, this question is, this next question is for Ellen. As a leader in human resources, how has the so-called great resignation shifted our strategy as a hospital to support the workforce? So this is a topic we've been talking about a lot uh, within HR, daily, hourly, by the minute, uh, and of course across across the hospital. I want to just start by just trying to define a little bit um, what we mean by the great resignation. I'm going to talk about it a little bit more broadly. It's a catchy term, but I think really you need to unpack it a little bit more and say, okay, what's really going on with the workforce right now? Because we're in the same way that the pandemic itself has been an unprecedented experience, what's happening in our current labor market is unprecedented. I, I wanna go back to something, Dr. Buziaka, you said at the very beginning, what we're experiencing today didn't start 20 months ago. It started long before that. When we, at the beginning of the pandemic in February of 2020, we had the lowest unemployment rate in the United States in 60 years. Unemployment in Boston area was at 2.2%. So we started the pandemic at a place where we were already facing you know, pretty significant challenges in the, in the labor market, very significant challenges in the labor market. During the pandemic, what we've seen, we talk about the great resignation. It's, it's a whole host of things. It is um, um, increases in retirement, 
It is people who may have been laid off during the pandemic, and I'm, I'm talking the general national labor force, not about children's, may have been laid off during the pandemic. Um, they are not returning to the workforce. Uh, partially that's because people you know, have looked at their retirement savings, partially because they, they're really not certain what they wanna do. They may not wanna go back to a job. Uh, we have seen uh, people dropping out of the workforce due to the uh, impact of schooling and, um, and lack of childcare. So clearly uh, the number of people who are available for regular employment, full-time employment has dropped sig significant shift um, from the permanent workforce into a temporary workforce. Uh, we've lost immigration uh, it changes, which started before the pandemic, the downstream impact of that, along with the fact that um, out of country, the entire out of country workforce has been severely impacted by COVID. Uh, one of the things that we've, uh, heard about that maybe I think it impacts all of us we think about is the impact of the opioid crisis on the labor market. Uh, estimated 800,000 plus people are no longer in the workforce as a result of the opioid crisis, just as a result of the pandemic. So all of these forces um, on top of what we now see, and I think we see a lot around the resignation and people changing jobs. So part of what the very constricted labor market has done is it's empowered people. It's empowered people to speak up and say, if I'm not well treated in a job, if I'm not well paid in a job, if I don't have fair benefits, I'm gonna go work someplace else. So I do think that part of this we're seeing is that empowerment. So against that whole backdrop, you know, Children's Hospital is a nonprofit. We have to compete against the for-profit marketplace. Uh, that can be challenging. Uh, you know, we, we can't always offer the same salary that a Google or a Facebook or a biofarm company can. Uh, but what, you know, we, we overall, I will say, uh, we, we, we are notwithstanding the fact that there are real pockets of, of, of challenges in parts of the hospital, our overall um, our overall hiring, uh, we're at 30% increase in 2021 over 20. So uh, we are working really hard to meet that. Uh, our turnover rate is uh, uh, down and it is uh, relative to other hospitals who have seen as much as 35%. Our overall turnover rate uh, is, is low compared to our peers. Uh, so we're trying to address staffing through, through retention. Uh, and I would say overall, with respect to recruitment, we are adding recruiters to ensure we have more resources. Uh, one of the initiatives that we just announced uh, recently is a hospital-wide employee referral bonus. Uh, and we're really seeing that that's having an impact. So if you're out there listening and you know someone who wants to work at Children's, uh, uh, it's a generous program. It's either $1,000 or $500, depending on the job. Uh, so that is one of the, I would say all of that. We have a new career site coming uh, and uh, just in a whole host of internship programs that are designed to build pipelines uh, throughout the community. So, I mean, I could, again, I could talk for probably several hours, but I just want to say, I, I think that con I gave a little bit of the context because I think it's important for people to understand that what we're experiencing in the hospital, what we're experiencing in healthcare is really what's happening across the entire country. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Alan. And I have not heard about that referral program. So thank you. <laughs> Um, as a member of the government relations team, I'm always looking at issues from a policy perspective. How can policymakers enhance your efforts to support the healthcare workforce? And this question is for the group and Allison, why don't, why don't you take it away? Okay, so a number of things. Um, I think about when we help our patients to access care, we, we help the healthcare workforce. So there are, as you know, there's the ABC bill that's out um, addressing issues of mental health, um, advancing those um, access barriers, addressing those access barriers is essential because the bottlenecking that we're seeing, the issues around access to um, psychiatric care, um, upstream and downstream, um, I think will make a tremendous uh, difference, including those um, mentioned by Dr. Abiziaco regarding um, reimbursement rates. Mm -hmm. With, you know, it costs money 
to provide these this care and to provide quality care where people can actually get better and live a life you know to their fullest potential and um, we cannot continue to underpay for this and expect a different result. Additionally, I think the policies that support patients to, um, and just community members to have access to the full complement of government supported social service programs with language access. So I know that I've worked with the folks in government relations around supporting a bill specifically to ensure that wherever we send families to access the additional supports to address the social determinants of health, of health that um, they be able to communicate with people in their language of origin. So I think about all of those things having the downstream impact on our workforce. Thank you, Allison. And um, Ellen, do you want to go next? Always hard to fall, Allison, on policy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm do you want to repeat the question again so I can reformulate it? Of for, course. For I, I'm interested to know um, how policymakers can support you and supporting the workforce, the efforts that you're making as a leader in human resources, what sorts of policy measures and, and systems change can policymakers help us with in terms of um, implementing some of those measures? Yeah, so I, I, I mean, I think there's a number of things. I, I know the Mass Hospital Association you know, has been very active um, uh, in in trying to work uh, with the hospital around around a variety of programs. I do think that one of the areas that's important is around leaves. Uh, people, we we have a very generous leave program within the state of Massachusetts. It's very supportive. Our employees, I think, are using it a lot, and that's they, they need that. I would say, from a policy perspective. Uh, Employers need a little bit more flexibility within that current structure to be able to design and implement pay programs that support um, and uh, that support employees and don't penalize employers for being being more generous than the law requires. And I, and I, we've we've been really challenged um, in some respects in that in that area. And so, you know, I think sometimes from a policy perspective. Uh, very well intended, but I, I think we, that's an area where I would would see us having um, a really, I think, a policy opportunity is 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 to is to join with a well intended statute, but give employers the tools that they need to be able to implement that. Uh, I I think beyond that, uh, I I those, that's what comes to mind. I, I would want to get to put a little bit more thought into that. Maybe we have another panel and we can come back. And talk. <laughs> Talk some more about about how how uh, state and federal policy can can help us with the with the current with the current climate. I, uh, I'll, I'll put my thinking cap on a little bit more, Mara. <laughs> Thank you, Ellen and Dr. Ibiziako. You spoke about parity. You spoke about reimbursement rates. Is there and and training and pipeline initiatives? Is there anything else that you wanted to touch on from a policy perspective? Um, you know, one of the things that has worried me with this crisis is that because of the gap in services, there are lots of well-meaning people stepping in to try to bridge that gap with that gap with lots of innovations. And from a policy perspective, I think it's important to have some kind of regulatory oversight of the initiatives and care models and you know, innovations, apps, and whatever else um, is being delivered, and to make sure that the care is safe, it's evidence-based, it's effective, it's patient-centered, it's equitable. So that's one thing. Mm -hmm. The other is um, with regards to specific patient population. You know, all of our patients are, are, are vulnerable, but there are specific patient populations in the mental health space that are even more underserved than others from a type of patient um, pr clinical presentation perspective. And two groups include patients with neurodevelopmental dis disabilities who are extremely underserved in the state of Massachusetts. 
and patients with comorbid medical conditions. Mm -hmm. And we would really want policymakers to recognize our efforts in trying to expand services for this patient population to use appropriate global data when making policy decisions to make sure that these populations are not left out. Thank you for bringing that up. And, and particularly when you spoke of innovation that's been coming out of this. And this time we've seen an uptick in telehealth use, which is really important in terms of access, but also sometimes can breed you know, further inequities. Um, what would you guys say about that? Um, I, I'll, I'll start with Allison. Thank you. Um, I, I'm very concerned about that. I'm, I'm concerned about it, not just in the behavioral health space, mm -hmm. but I'm also concerned about that um, in terms of who receives telehealth. Um, telehealth provides a wonderful access opportunity. It removes a number of the barriers that um, particularly people who are living in poverty, who are working poor, they don't have the ability to get out of work and spend the whole day coming to an appointment. They don't have a car. They're traveling from parts of the city that are not well served by public transportation. Um, they may not have um, family supports to make that possible. They risk losing their jobs if they come in. So there's tons of access barriers. And when you have an evening appointment via telehealth, that's amazing, right? And so I am thrilled that that is part of what we can offer now and then that there's been this adoption of that. On the other hand, I worry that there may be some populations because they don't experience those access barriers that have the benefit of a face-to-face -face appointment and who may, whose, whose children may get the full exam, who may have a longer conversation with a provider. Um, children may have the opportunity to share if they have concerns about what's happening for them privately. Um, they may reveal issues related to mental health child maltreatment, concerns in their community that are not gonna occur in this very sort of expeditious, you know, somewhat two-dimensional kind of um, exchange. And so I think we have to be very, very careful about who is given the, um, the tools they need to come in. I don't want us to give up on removing those other access barriers so that everyone has access to the same high quality experience of being physically in the presence of a, of a provider. And I want our clinicians and our providers to really be thoughtful mm -hmm. about for whom it's contraindicated. When we see people in the behavioral health space who are um, at risk of self-harm or self-injury or harm to others, we may want them to be able to come to more appointments and use telehealth, but the truth is this is a contraindication. We need to physically see that, that patient in many, many cases, and we could miss important indications of um, regression or deterioration of their, of their um, clinical presentation over time. So we also can't always ensure privacy with telehealth. So someone can be outside of the screen, you know, yeah. visibility, and you could be exposed, uh, exposing people to um, confidentiality breaches as a result of that. So there, it's a wonderful tool, but it also has the potential to actually increase health inequities, mm -hmm. and there could be dangers associated with that. So I really would love to see us think very, very deeply and, and really address this, look at the data as we go forward and use this technology to ensure that we're not deepening health inequities um, and that we are ensuring that everyone has, an act, has adequate access to truly you know, premier level of care that we've come to provide here. Mm, that is also important. And while you were speaking, it honestly reminded me um, of the flexibility that we've seen in in-person work, hybrid work and remote work and how that might impact the workforce. Um, and you guys are all leaders in your department, but I would like to start with Ellen and others can chime in if they'd like. How has this impacted the culture of Boston Children's Hospital and, and how, is, how are you thinking about this from an HR perspective? It's interesting that uh, you asked the question because as Allison was talking, I, I always think that 
uh, on the administrative side, we can learn so much from what, what we hear, the challenges that are happening on the clinical side, right? And when you talk about people being lost, when you talk about inequities and, and, and the need to be able to connect, because you can see here and experience certain things live that you can't ex not always experience remotely. And I was thinking about that is that sometimes it's not just about whether you can do your job remotely, it's about all the other parts of your job that you might need to connect with. It's that training, it's the relationship building, it's the network building. And, and so there are, I think we've worked really, really hard to replicate all of that in a remote context for employees who are working fully remotely. But I think we also recognize that there is a need for human connection um, to ensure that people don't get lost, that, it, that we have equity in the workplace, uh, and uh, and that we are bringing people together, and 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 we, and and that we stay connected to the pulse of the hospital. There is something about just literally being in the lobby and seeing that experience of what a family is going through on any given day, and what our providers are going through on any given day, and staying close to that and understanding that. Uh, and so I, I and I, I think there are ben great benefits from working remotely, but I also think there are great benefits from the in-person connection that comes in, whether it's whether it's part of your regular job or whether it's a periodic connection. And so I think as we think about how we move into the future in our, you know, away from social distancing and post in our whatever post pandemic world looks like, we have to take all the best parts of remote work, but we also have to keep in mind the best parts of being together too. Uh, and uh, I, I have seen this firsthand when we've brought our teams together. Uh, it's warm, it's, it's people are happy to see each other. So I, I, I said, I think it's finding that right balance. I think, um... As we expand our services and have satellites everywhere, we, we also need to think about the role of, of just telehealth in having meetings and um, just being able to have people feel connected to the enterprise. Um, I do think that there's a lot of work still done. Telehealth has been revolutionary in, in, in the context of this pandemic. And, and it's not gonna go anywhere. It, it has expanded access and it has great potential for future care, especially for uh, mental health care. But there's still a lot of work to be done with regards to quality control and uh, learning more about some of the things that feel like they're contraindicated now, but are there ways to improve the technology so that you can do safety assessments, so that you can see a patient with autism, so that you can see um, a young child who needs to do play therapy. You know, there, there, there are lots of ways that we need to better understand and better improve the technology um, and, and also do more evidence. One of the debates we had in our department um, several months ago was what exactly is evidence-based therapy versus telehealth? If you, if you don't have your video on and you've not visualized the patient and you've been speaking to them on the phone for six weeks, six months, is that evidence-based therapy? You know, so there's, there's a lot of work that needs to be done, but I think it plays a major role and will continue to play a major role. Thank you all. I just have a few more questions. And this one I will um, ask the group and whoever wants to answer, please feel free. In healthcare, many, many workers are women, especially at a children's hospital. And they often are the primary, ha have the primary childcare responsibilities or elder care responsibilities at home. How can we ensure that steps, that the steps that we are taking, women have, um, the opportunity for professional growth and engagement fully in the workforce with that dynamic. And I think possibly Ellen, you've been thinking about this, uh, but others, please do chime in. Yes, we definitely have been thinking about this. I, I wanna just make, emphasize that, that this is the, 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 the need for an employer Boston Children's to be responsive to child care needs and elder care needs it crosses all genders so it's it is uh, and what we have seen you know overall in the larger 
market is that the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on women in the workforce, that, that, it, that is real. Uh, I think some of the things that we have tried to do just overall at Children's is uh, we quickly, right at the beginning of the pandemic, expanded um, our child care offerings uh, to provide more emergency child care services. Uh, I think uh, we've been working, I would say overall, to, you know, I talked earlier about the importance of schedule flexibility. I think that is really, really important and, and managers and employees have to keep a very open dialogue so that we meet people where they are. Uh, and, and because without flexibility, it's, it's, it's hard for everybody, uh, especially when you're dealing with, you know, either a sick elderly relative, uh, a family member who might be living at home with you, uh, children, and, and we really encouraged managers and employees to work together to find solutions. And I, I think that I, I, I encourage people to just continue to continue with that approach. A lot of solutions really are at that individual level. Uh, from a systemic perspective, definitely, you know, we want to see, um, you know, I think it's, it's around the services uh, and at the, uh, you know, at the manager level and, and employee level, it's around meeting, meeting individual needs. I think beyond that, um, uh, we've been having some discussions about, uh, you know, more specifically, you know, what we do to, around, uh, we, we certainly look closely at pay, we look close at, at uh, career opportunities for, for, uh, for our employees and uh, uh, are, you know, monitoring kind of how we're doing. So that's sort of part of our day-to-day -day practice. Uh, mm -hmm. And that will sort of, that continues with pandemic or no pandemic. I don't know if others have any thoughts on this one. Um, absolutely. Thank you so much for raising this. I think because um, such uh, many of our critical patient facing roles are predominantly occupied by women who do typically um, assume the lion's share of child care and elder care responsibility in their families. And that, that's not to say that it doesn't happen in different ways, um, but that's just statistically the reality. Um, one of the things that I think is super important is exactly what Ellen um, described, which is sort of a, a one person at a time, you know, conversation about how to continue to hold on to valued, dedicated people who move through periods of time over the course of their career here, where they're, they really need to attend to family um, responsibilities in a more focused way and allowing for adjustments to be made, whether it's with you know scheduling, remote, hybrid, um, different ways of being a leader if there are you know demands that that create a scenario where being an operational leader may not be really something somebody wants to do in that moment because of the other demands that they have allowing other leadership opportunities to be considered for folks who have those kinds of schedules and demands over time recognizing that that time is going to pass and we want that person to rec to, to see that we value them we want to hold on to them and that there may be a period of time where their focus really needs to be family first and see them through that. And then when that sort of abates, which it often does after it may be years, right? And that they're still with us and they've got that institutional um, history and the relationships and awareness and deepening expertise from having been here that we will continue to benefit from. So I would like to think about that long view of, of an employee over time or a staff person over time and trying to sort out that be, it doesn't have to be a zero sum game that you, you don't develop and, and move into leadership roles simply because you have other caregiving responsibilities. We can find ways for people to do both. Um, it, you know, collaboratively. So setting that tone and inviting those conversations, I think is extremely, extremely important. And then additionally, just back to your legislative um, question, really talking about how to support after school programming, subsidized child care, um, the kinds of things that make it possible for people to go to work each day and know that their children are engaged and cared for, and also elder care, um, you know, access to elder care as well. So those are broader social programs that I think could use some bolstering um, across the Commonwealth. 
Well, we're running out of time, but one of the things that I, I think we should also take into consideration with this discussion is the impact on opportunities for advancement. Um, because the time taken away to care for family members, to have a flexible schedule, means people are not as competitive when it comes to leadership roles um, and other people um, get hired in their place. And so we really need to be creative about how we pay attention to advancing women, women in academia, women all across, um, so that they don't feel like they have to make a choice between having a career and having a family. Thank you so much for that. That is so important. Um, and I will close on a positive note um, with a question for the group. I would say, what is something that has come out of this challenging season that you would say is a bright spot or a silver lining in a word or sentence? And I'm happy to start with you, um, Dr. Ibiziako. I mean, laughing <laughs> in a word. <laughs> or sentence, or sentence. Two sentences. <laughs> One is breaking the stigma and the impact of talking more about mental health and raising awareness and the mental health advocacy. That has been huge in the context of this pandemic. Okay, that was two sentences. <laughs> the second is resilience. One of the things I'm hopeful for, aside from resilience in our patients and families and children and adolescents who have gone through this huge adversity, is that as an organization, we come out of this learning important lessons and becoming more resilient as an organization so we continue to attract and retain the brightest and the best. Thank you. Looks like you want to go, Ellen. <laughs> First of all, I'm incapable of a two sentence response to the <laughs> answer if anyone <laughs> everyone knows that. I, I, I think, just I'm incredibly proud of how our hospital has worked together to support each other over the pandemic. Uh, the amount of care, love, support under the most trying circumstances that people have given each other, not just our patients, but each other is just uh, ice moving. And it, it has been in every single corner of the hospital and it has been really hard and people have stood by themselves. They've stood by their colleagues. They've stood by um, each other. And I, I, I just think it's that sense of just enormous pride um, that I would put that no, number one as, as what I would say as the pandemic has given us as a, as a, as a gift. Uh, I think we had it here before and, and really, really strongly, but I think we've seen it in, in, in so many different ways um, throughout the last, last 20 months. I guess I would say that it's the, what's happened for me and for I think many people has been a recalibration of priorities and what human connection has really been, um, it's been made clear to us that human connection and um, coalescing around a mission and caring for each other, um, those priorities have really come to the surface in part because of the valiant, you know, Herculean efforts of people to continue on through such, adversity, but additionally, when we see each other, when we're together, um, we are noticing just how precious it is to be in each other's company um, and how important that is above maybe anything else. And I think that that's something that we, we can't be reminded of enough and we've learned it in a way that I hope that we never ever lose sight of. Wow. Well, thank you all so much for being here today. I, I feel like I've learned a lot. Um, and we so also appreciate all of you who joined the webinar. We'll close things out with that. Thank you. Yeah.